Aaron Swartz is an internet pioneer and activist. He was one of the co-founders of RSS feed and, and Reddit. Uh, he was a person who was in favor of transparency in the government. Uh, he was caught uh, speedily downloading material from a company called JSTOR that stores academic articles. He thought the academic articles should be free for the whole public because they were important source of information. Now this violated the terms of service of his contracts with JSTOR and he accessed open MIT computers to do that. Now it's if, if it's a crime, well it's an incredibly minor crime and whether it's a crime is a matter of great debate and one they would have had at his trial because this is really a, a transaction between uh, Aaron who had access to both the MIT computers legally and JSTOR's uh, information legally he just downloaded it quicker than their terms of service allowed for and in fact uh, the, of course the government pursued him with great vigor and at his funeral his father was irate about that and gave this speech. I said to Eric Brimson, the chancellor, in, in, in one of my two meetings with him, what, why are you trying, why are you destroying my son? He said he wasn't. He was cataclysmically wrong. Aaron did not commit suicide, but was killed by the government, and MIT was betrayed all of its basic principles. Now those are strong words, but if you notice, he left out JSTOR. You know why? Because the company that was aggrieved actually did not file criminal or civil charges. And in fact, they urged the government to drop the case. It was incredibly minor. Instead, the government asked for 35 years in jail, 13 felony counts, including wire fraud. It's way overkill. So everybody was wondering why. Why did they do this? Well, we might have gotten some clues recently. WikiLeaks put out several tweets recently that made people go hmm interesting first they said due to the investigation into the secret service involvement with Aaron Swartz we have decided to disclose the following facts now they normally they don't disclose who their sources are but here they said quote Aaron Swartz assisted WikiLeaks then they said Aaron Swartz was in communication with Julian Assange including during 2010 and 2011 we have a, and finally we have strong reasons to believe but cannot prove that Aaron Swartz was a WikiLeaks source. Hmm. Now, look, that's a Twitter account, and even they say they're not positive because they have a double failsafe in their system uh, so that no one person at WikiLeaks can know the sources so that they can't tell the government. So it's interesting that they're putting those tweets out there. And Marcy Wheeler has written about it at mtwheel.net. She writes, it appears the government tried and failed to establish a criminal connection between Aaron and WikiLeaks. And when they failed to do that, they increased their hardline stance on the JSTOR charges. That's also an interesting theory. Now, WikiLeaks is not the only thing that people are inquiring about. And by the way, this is not some wild-eyed liberals that came, with this, came up with this idea. And Aaron was a liberal, there's no question about that. But conservative Senator John Corner from Texas wrote a letter to Attorney General Eric Holder asking some intriguing questions. Let me quote the letter. Second, was the prosecution of Mr. Swartz in any way retaliation for his exercise of his rights as a citizen under the Freedom of Information Act? If so, I recommend that you refer the matter immediately to the Inspector General. Let me actually pause on the letter and skip ahead to what he's talking about there. Because it turns out Aaron Swartz also did a Freedom of Information request on the issue of Bradley Manning. He wrote a letter saying, any records related to Bradley Manning or his confinement in Quantico Brig, he wanted access to. Under the Freedom of Information Act, he should have access to those. He asked, as you can tell there, in December 27th, of 2010. Now, what he wanted, and he had permission from the person that Bradley Manning spoke to at the brig, was an account of how Bradley Manning was treated because it was recorded in their conversation. And they had it. And he wanted that to be a public record. Again, trying to bring more transparency to the government. Of course, the government fought him tooth and nail on that. So that's interesting. Now, Cornyn, the Republican, points that out. And then he continues in his letter. Third, I mean, these are all the different questions he's asking. Third, what role, if any, did the department's prior investigations of Mr. Swartz play in the decision of with which crimes to charge him? Please explain the basis for your answer. 
That's also interesting, because it mentions prior investigations of Aaron before any of this JSTOR stuff. Does it referencing WikiLeaks, the Bradley Manning Freedom of Information request? But there's more. His sixth question. Sixth, was it the intention of the U.S. attorney and or her subordinates to make an example of Mr. Swartz? Now, why would they want to make an example of him for a minor violation terms of service contract with an academic record paper holder? That makes no sense whatsoever. Apparently, Senator Cornyn believes they wanted to make an example of him for different reasons. And then finally, this interesting fact pointed out again by Marcy Wheeler. This is a timeline of how the case broke down. Now, as we told you, on December 27th, Swartz filed a, what they call a FOIA request, recording, uh, asking for the recording of the House's visit, and that was the person visiting Manning, which would have captured Manning's describing, in his own words, how he was being treated. January 4th of 2011, just a couple of days later, MIT happens to find Swartz's computer in that closet where he had hooked it into the MIT computers, and the Secret Silver takes over the investigation. On January 6th, a couple days later, he's arrested. February 11th, 2011, and this one's interesting in the timeline. The Secret Service searches Swartz's house and office, but not the hardware primarily implicated in the crime purportedly being investigated. So the hardware that was involved in the JSTOR crime, they leave alone. Now, could they be incompetent? Of course that's possible, right? But the one thing that they were theoretically going to get, they don't get. But they grab everything else. It's almost as if they were interested in something else. So when you put all this together, it is at the very least a very interesting question as to why the government was going so hard after Aaron Swartz. If it had perhaps nothing to do with JSTOR and MIT at all, but that they were using it as a ruse to target WikiLeaks and to target Swartz for daring to ask about the treatment of Bradley Manning. Now hopefully we'll find out more about this case and find out if that is the case. But right now these are intriguing questions. But the government would never go after somebody for trying to expose what they've done, right? No, just ask Bradley Manning or Julian Assange or all the different whistleblowers that President Obama tried to uh, try under the Espionage Act. By the way, President Obama, that's another record of his. Record deportations, record drug dispensary raids, and record number of people, whistleblowers, charged with the Espionage Act, giving information to our enemies. Apparently, when you give information to the American public or the press, they're now considered the enemies.